STEMI is now managed uh, in a careful and comprehensive way derived from the answer to four fundamental questions. The first is, what is the time from symptom onset? Where are we in the evolution of the STEMI? The second is, uh, what is the risk of the STEMI itself? Not all are the same, and so understanding quickly how to characterize the risk of the heart attack may affect its ultimate management. The third is, um, what are the risks of the clot busting treatment uh, that we know is very effective, especially if it's given early in the course of the myocardial infarction? And the fourth question again comes back to time, and that is, what is the time from where the patient is first seen to arriving at an expert facility that could provide the balloon treatment and the catheter opening in a specialized facility? And it's really the incorporation of those four questions that allows for a sensible approach to first-line management. If the time to arrival at a first-class 24-hour, seven-day-a-week facility is longer than 60 minutes from the time you can give a clot buster, then the clot buster is the right treatment unless it's frankly contraindicated because of the risk of stroke or excess bleeding. And, and so I think incorporating these uh, questions in the day-to-day -day management of patients with STEMI provides us a platform on which you can make common sense, good judgment, evidence-based decisions. So non-STEMI is a uh, more diverse uh, myocardial infarction than STEMI. The diagnosis is often not as clear. Uh, there may or may not be uh, ST segment changes on the electrocardiogram that are depressed as opposed to elevated. Uh, but generally speaking, uh, these patients need an early evaluation. They need uh, a sensible triage based on the occurrence of markers or biomarkers or indications of myocardial damage. And uh, the uh, risk of these patients is often divided into three phases. The high-risk group that should uh, really be triaged to uh, early uh, investigation in a catheterization laboratory to see if there's a mechanical lesion that could be corrected or fixed. Uh, the bottom uh, quarter or, ha or, or one fifth, which are very low risk and can often be managed in a chest pain uh, program in the emergency room and uh, perhaps have some therapy, uh, early diagnosis, even an exercise test and be then discharged home and followed as an outpatient. And then this middle group of perhaps two-thirds of the patients that really require more careful contemplation about what are the indications for proceeding with uh, invasive study or not. Whatever the, the case, all of the patients should get aspirin. Uh, they often, if they're going to be admitted, will get an antithrombotic therapy, often uh, a heparin-type uh, therapy, and uh, often then uh, an additional more powerful antiplatelet therapy such as clopidogrel or Plavix. Uh, as the first line management. And there, uh, from there we can triage and decide based on risk what other correctable factors might be undertaken. The appropriate management of MI is of heart attack, of STEMI, ST elevation heart attack, is really based upon opening the artery uh, rapidly. Um, there's very clear evidence that we improve outcomes by opening the artery in the setting of STEMI and acute heart attack. There's no debate about that. Um, fibrinolysis has years of research using drugs to facilitate opening the artery. And in the more recent era, our pharmacoinvasive approaches have, have backstopped the fibrinolytic, the, the upfront clot buster, by ensuring an open artery through simple ECG documentation of success of clot buster. And if it doesn't work, moving on to the cath lab and this pharmacoinvasive strategy basically guarantees best care for individual patients. When it comes to primary PCI and moving directly to the cath lab in an attempt to open the artery, many think of that as the definitive therapy, but we still have complications and problems that we don't fully understand how to manage. When we do deploy the stent, there's clot present in the artery that, that moves distally quite frequently and we'll end up in a situation of having a great epicardial result, but still having distal clot in the, in the arterial bed and less than optimal perfusion in the microvasculature or the myocardial level perfusion. 
And this is really a, a very fertile ground for further research, whether that's pharmacological co-intervention with primary PCI or other mechanisms to prevent the, the reperfusion injury that we know happens.